And we have over 2,000 industry placements. And we have a key emphasis on employability to ensure that when you graduate, you have the greatest opportunity to enroll in a career. So just to touch on a few of the subjects I've briefly mentioned before about the biomed sciences and pharmacy optometry. So pharmacy and optometry are the two top ranked subjects in the UK. Uh, they are both integrated undergrad and postgrad courses. So you graduate with an MPharm or an MOPTOM. So it's four years to get your undergrad, your bachelor's and your master's. Uh, and Sorry. <laughs> it's okay. And then a lot of other students, a lot of Canadian students also enroll in our law programs and our physiotherapy programs. Physio is probably one of the most competitive courses we have as there's only five places available for all international students around the world. Okay. okay, so we have our four faculties, which is the arts, humanities, and social sciences. We have computing, engineering, and built environments, life and health science, and Ulster University's business school. And the business school is the fifth largest in the whole of the UK and the largest on the island of Ireland. So it offers everything that you can think of in terms of business programs from accountancy, finance, to culinary arts, business studies in general, uh, hospitality and international management and tourism. There's three highlighted there and I have touched on them so far, optometry, pharmacy and physio, purely because most of our Canadian students are studying on those three programs. Just because of the... Um, the process that it Canada coming to the UK just offers an alternative option and can reduce study duration. Sharon sure, said whilst it is part of the UK, uh, it kind of has its very own separate and distinct culture to uh, the rest of the UK as well. Uh, studying in Scotland offers great opportunities and Scotland is recognised as having more world-class universities per head of population than just about anywhere else uh, in the world. It's a really vibrant and multi multicultural place and is really well known uh, for its warm welcome. Uh, it is important to consider when you are considering your options, if you're looking at other institutions in the UK, Scotland has a slightly different uh, degree structure uh, and it tends to be uh, a year more than if you were studying a degree uh, in Northern Ireland, England uh, or Wales. So our, de our degree structure is very similar to that of uh, the US uh, and, and that is because the US actually templated uh, our uh, degree structure and education, higher education system when they were implementing uh, their own. So our degree structure is four years, it provides a kind of broad-based study uh, where you often take outside, outside subjects for the first couple of years, followed by specialist honours level study. Uh, so you can, again, like the US system, study a range of subjects in the first two years and then the last couple of years uh, really kind of focus in on your specialised area. Uh, and in Glasgow itself, so Glasgow is Scotland's largest uh, city. It isn't the capital, the capital is Edinburgh, but Glasgow is Scotland's largest city, which is uh, home to about a million uh, people. It's a very student-centric city. I believe we have five universities uh, within the city centre, within the city limits. So there's a lot going on for students uh, and there's a big student population here uh, in the city. So, you know, it's a great place to be if you are a domestic student or international student, uh, and it's a really great environment for, for students. Uh, it wa Glasgow was voted the eighth best city in the world, uh, as voted by Time Out magazine in, in 2019, and it's really well known uh, for its warm, warm welcome. It hosted the Commonwealth Games back in 2014, and the, the common phrase was that people make Glasgow, and that was because the tourists and visitors that came for the Commonwealth Games uh, were so touched and, and felt so welcomed by the people uh, of Glasgow, uh, and that's something that the city has kind of taken on as its motto and has been really proud of uh, ever since those Commonwealth Games uh, six years ago, unbelievably. Uh, the cost of living for Glasgow uh, for a major city within Europe is fairly reasonable, provides great value for money for students as well. Uh, 
and um, Glasgow. Sorry, sorry, sir. We have a slide about the accommodation and the living costs in on the Scotland, so we probably can go through that uh, information a bit later. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, that's that's fine. That that was that was the only brief point I had on had on that that part. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so if you just want to go onto the the map of of if you can go back to the previous slide, please, Asia. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so obviously, this just gives you an idea of how centrally located uh, GCU is. So GCU is a single site, self-contained campus right in the middle of Glasgow. So uh, in Glasgow itself is a very well-connected uh, city to the rest of Scotland. Uh, and the university is very well-connected within the city and very close to transport links. Uh, you know, it's a walking distance from the main bus station, two main tr major train stations uh, and the subway station as well as the major motorway connecting Scotland's two main cities, Glasgow and Edinburgh. Uh, as I said, GCU is located right in the city centre, so you ha students have the best of both worlds where you know they have everything in the one campus, on the one site, uh, so they don't need to venture too far. However, if they do want to go and explore or they need to get anything, uh, outside of the campus, then they are in the best place possible and within walking distance uh, for, for pretty much everywhere. Uh, our accommodation is located right uh, next to the campus as well, and the campus has had multi-million pound investment into redeveloping it back in 2015. So the campus is very modern, high-tech facilities uh, are now in place since that redevelopment. Uh, next slide, please. Yes, yeah. So just... Uh, just want to give you a little bit of information on, on the makeup of, of the university. Uh, currently, we have over 20,000 students worldwide from over 100 countries. Uh, so, we're, you know, whilst we're a new and a modern university, we have uh, grown and established ourselves in a very short space of time, and we are a global uh, university. Uh, we're very good student student to faculty ratio of 11 to 1 which obviously shows our commitment to investing into our teaching uh, facilities uh, and ensuring that student student experience is of the best quality possible uh, as i said we've got other campuses uh, we've got our other main campus in london and new york which are primarily postgraduate campuses whereas our glasgow campus is a, an undergraduate, postgraduate uh, and research based campus as well. Uh, we've got over 100 undergraduate programmes across our three schools, uh, which our three schools are the School of Business, uh, the Glasgow School for Business and Society, our School of Health and Life Sciences and our School of Computing, Engineering and Built Environment. Uh, like uh, Ulster, our kind of degrees are, are very kind of practical in the way that we, we teach and, and we look to provide students the right schools, knowledge and expertise to enter the workplace as, as soon as they've graduated. And obviously this is exemplified by the fact that 95% of our students are employed or in further study within six months of graduating. Uh, we've got multiple top 10 UK ranked programmes at undergraduate level. And this includes optometry, social work, hospitality, uh, forensic science and, and podiatry, just to name uh, a few. Uh, as I said, our, our programmes are industry driven and accredited, so they're kept up to date, relevant. Uh, so like you said, you are ready to go into the workplace and the skills that you and knowledge that you, you do develop in the course, you can actually use when you enter the workplace as well. Uh, and lastly, on this part, just want to say that you may, usually our, our, our university motto is uh, for the common good. So and we'll refer to ourselves as university for the common good and, and the common good kind of theme runs through everything uh, that we do. So uh, our mission is to make a kind of positive difference to the communities that we serve. And this is the heart of, of what we do, especially in our social innovation teaching and our research. Uh, and, and we were often asked you know, to explain this and what does this mean? And, and for us, it's just, we understand it, that students want to do well, they want to thrive, they want to be successful and they want to be kind of financially rewarded for their hard work. Uh, but as a university, we support and we encourage this, but we always support and encourage our students uh, and our staff and, and our uh, to really kind of remember to, to give back to the communities that, that they have been in and been part of and, and maybe haven't been as, as beneficial uh, as them as themselves and, and help others reach their goals as well. Um, okay. And sorry, go ahead. Yes, Jane. Oh, let me just uh, one sec. I'm going to be unmuting you. Thank you. Okay. Hello, everyone. 
good afternoon um, wherever you are or good evening from London. So um, uh, I'm here, I'm from the University of Westminster. My name's Jane and I also work supporting international students from Canada and all of the Americas who are coming to study with us and work alongside our representatives such as Student Solutions um, who work with us in Canada to help you if you'd like to come and join us. Um, so the University of Westminster is in London. Um, if you know London, then you may recognise this map, but otherwise, um, this just shows where our campuses are very similar to the other two institutions you've heard from today. We're in the city, we're very much part of the City of London. We were actually established to teach Londoners professional skills in the 1800s, and so that's really still what we do, and it reflects our teaching, our subject area cover as well, and then the fact of where we are around the city. So we're right in the heart. We've got four uh, main buildings um, and three faculties that's split into three faculties and I'm going to go through those in a second uh, but you can maybe recognize some of the big landmarks there to get a, an idea. Greater London's obviously very big a very big metropolitan area but central London itself is actually really quite small uh, I think a lot of people are surprised by that when they think about studying in London and the fact that it actually can be friendly isn't the most expensive city in the world um, and it was also been voted the number one student city in the world the past two years in a row um, by um, QS rankings, so by students themselves looking at cities. And that takes into account everything really when you're thinking about the student experience. Um, so I think um, obviously nobody's done a ranking for 2020, it's been a very different year, but uh, 18 and 19, who knows what 2021 has to hold, has to hold for all of us, but we will see. Um, so I think you can go ahead. Yeah, I'll just go through very quickly. So we also have a very bit, uh, strong professional focus, but maybe slightly different subject areas. Um, so um, we have three faculties, as I've mentioned. So one of them is digital and creative industries. Um, and from Canada, we get quite a lot of applications for architecture, which is one of our very strong programmes. Um, also within that um, media, media practice, we're very well known for journalism. And communications, um, a fantastic research centre for that. Um, and we get quite a lot of applications as well for fashion and fashion design, which is another one of our really strong um, programmes. Then we have a faculty of liberal arts and sciences. Um, within there is law, always popular for Canada for, for, for all students and all institutions. Um, also psychology sits within that, and then things across international relations and social sciences politics um, and then we have a faculty um, the business school uh, we tend to get a, a lot of students uh, for marketing and marketing related subjects uh, which we have a lot of uh, professional uh, recognitions for um, but obviously a wide business school covering finance business management all those areas um, so yeah we're at average size I'd say about 20,000 students again but split along those four um, sites so quite yeah, fairly comparable for the UK. Um, I think you can go on to the next slide. Right. And this was just a little bit about why London. Um, so obviously, uh, lots of reasons to look at the UK in general, um, and might, why you might want to study um, and, and travel to come and join us. But just focusing specifically on London, it's obviously really a lot of students choose Westminster because they want to enjoy the experience and they would like to enjoy London as well. And that's not just about the cultural and the social side um, of the theatres and galleries and everything that will hopefully be open again very soon, but it's also about the professional experience. You know, um, London still does have, it's still the, it's the number one tourist city. Um, we are still one of the four um, places that people come to for the main fashion houses. Um, if you're looking at film and TV, the BBC, which is down the road from us, is still the biggest broadcaster in the world. Um, and anything across businesses, if you're looking at places where the European headquarters are, most multinational European headquarters or offices, you've got there from the 75% Fortune 500. So lots of reasons to think about London. Um, and it, of course, the experience and the fun and enjoying the city. And then also for Westminster, um, we are one of the most diverse universities. Um, we have more than 165 different nationalities and we really reflect London. And what that means for you as a student is both gaining that experience um, and hopefully developing different perspectives in the classroom. Our staff is made up of um, 
teaching staff from all over the globe and they also understand uh, students coming in from different educational backgrounds, um, possibly with different um, learning goals and, and desires from their programme. And also it's really welcoming. I think London's much friendlier than people often give it credit for. And um, most of our students, the things they say to me, they talk about their particular course and what they wanted to do and then they really do talk about meeting um, meeting peers and students from all over the world and really enjoying that experience and going on to benefit in the future for their professional networks of having all those contacts as well as just the, the enjoyment of it. So that's a little bit about Westminster and I'll hand you back over. I don't think there are any more slides from me. Now back to Johnny now about the tuition fees and what also has to offer for scholarships too. Yeah. Brilliant. Thanks Yasser. Um, so yeah, uh, one of the things that I just want to cover here is the affordability of studying in the UK, especially if you're considering going overseas, perhaps we're considering going to the US, but studying in the UK is generally a lot more affordable. Um, and compared to some Canadian universities, it can be much more affordable as well. So for us, our tuition fees for undergrad and postgrad, uh, for most postgrad programs, are 14,910 a year. Uh, and that is a three-year undergrad, one-year postgrad. Some of our postgrad courses have an extended research element to them, so they could be add an extra three-month research or placement projects, and a couple of courses have an extra year. So those extra credits does add an additional fee, brings a fee up to around £19,500. Uh, so 20,000 even, yeah, it's got up a little bit. So yeah, we have a, de a, a deposit of 2,000 pounds and students were able to spread the costs over a five month installment plan just to help break down those costs a little bit. We are able to accept various Canadian government funding such as uh, OSAP, the OSAP, however you pronounce it, uh, British Council, uh, British Council, British Columbia funding, uh, as well as other prov provincial funding bodies as well. Okay, so as I mentioned before, we do have the £2,000 scholarship and that's off each year of study. So off your full degree, that does equate to £6,000 as a tuition fee reduction overall. Excellent. Um, let me just go to... So the thing I was actually referring to before as well uh, was just in relation to the tuition fees. Living in Northern Ireland, particularly in Belfast, it, has been um, assessed as the most affordable student destination in the UK. So the fees uh, and the living costs do reflect its affordability. So just something to bear in mind, folks. Right. Okay, um, this is for our stock. Give me just a second and meet you. Yeah. Thanks, you see. So, so yeah. So, as you can see, our undergraduate uh, study cost to study per year is twelve thousand two hundred uh, and fifty pounds. And for a one-year master's program at either uh, Glasgow, London, uh, would be thirteen and a half thousand pounds. These are our standard rates. We do have some programs that that are slightly higher uh, than that. And obviously, if interested in any of those, I can I can share those details with, with you later. Uh, our two years master's programs that we have uh, available for some of our uh, London programs and some of our uh, Glasgow based programs in our business school uh, would be at a slightly higher rate of £18,000 uh, as well. Uh, like uh, joining the state for Ulster, we also have a, a deposit required for international students, for students that are would be required to apply for a, a student visa, uh, and our deposit is three and a half thousand uh, pounds but that amount is obviously taken off your tuition fee uh, and then you would be left to pay uh, the remaining amount which you can split up and spread across the cost spread the cost uh, with one of our installment payment plans which I think breaks up into uh, eight separate payments uh, throughout the year uh, so that payment plan is available for international students uh, as well and uh, next slide please So our scholarships here, so these are uh, the two listed there are, are automatic scholarships that applied for the national students coming to study uh, at GCU for the first time. So for an undergraduate, you're offered uh, £1,000 uh, per year. So it's up to £4,000 
over the four years. Uh, and for our master's program, uh, it would be 1,600 if you were doing a one year. Uh, and if you're doing a two year, you would get a, an additional uh, 1,000 pound scholarship on top of that. Uh, we have a number of other kind of postgraduate scholarships in, in particular uh, and subject specific scholarships that cover you know our, our fashion programs climate justice and um, mechanical engineering uh, just to name just to name a few uh, and in particular we have our, our early payment discount uh, that if you pay tuition fees up front before the first first day of teaching then, then you get a five percent discount off uh, your fees and also we have a loyalty international loyalty discount that that international students who have maybe come to gcu on on an exchange uh, have maybe come to our summer school uh, would be offered a discount of up to five thousand pounds if they have uh, if they've studied with us uh, previously as well and that would apply if you are had taken undergraduate and were looking to move to a master's degree uh, as well okay so james i believe it's yours just going to be unmuting you as well yep um, if I may say, Milla, so we our undergraduate program is fourteen thousand four hundred per year. Our masters vary, and it depends on the program. Um, they vary be, between twelve thousand and about nineteen thousand at the moment uh, for the MBA. So um, you're looking around twelve thirteen thousand for most of them. A lot of the business courses around fourteen fifteen thousand pounds. Um, we ask for a deposit as well for students applying for visas when they've made a final decision that they'd like to join us, and that again is taken off the course fee. Um, and so that's four thousand um, pounds, and then uh, we have option only really for two or three instalment plan uh, payments. So fairly similar. Um, and in terms of our scholarships, um, so our scholarship scheme is a little bit different. Um, the information here is really just a guide. So actually, our scholarship scheme. Um, is a separate application. So you have to apply for a course and receive an offer, and then you can apply for a scholarship with us. We have a range of scholarships. Uh, they are just about to be announced for September 21, um, and will be updated. But generally, uh, they range from partial scholarships, which uh, are equate to about two or 3,000 pounds off your fee, up to a very small number of tuition fee and then a very, very small number of full scholarships, which cover everything. Um, those are obviously highly competitive um, and they look for financial need, uh, development, so what's your plan for your studies in the future, as well as academic excellence. And the partial and half scholarships looking more for good students who are going to contribute to the university community and have good grades. Um, and so if you want to find any more information about that, they're on our website. But as I say, you apply for the course, get an offer, and then do submit an application for a scholarship. Um, and there's always a deadline to apply by May, if you want to come in September, and also by an October date if you want to join any of our January start programs that we offer. So I will, I will get back on this thing about uh, what additional uh, things you guys require the universities look into providing the scholarship to students. We have a slide about the admission process. So that will be a bit more helpful for students as well. Uh, if you guys later on highlight on what additional steps would be helpful in order to gain or apply for a scholarship too. So uh, I'm gonna go with the, the last slide for, for Ulster. Johnny, give me a thing. Yeah. Thanks, Yasser. Uh, yeah, so as I mentioned before, we have our four campuses around Northern Ireland. Um, so we have two city-based campuses and two rural um, self-contained campuses, but all four campuses have guaranteed accommodation for international students. So the only campus where you really have a bit of a distance to walk is at McGee campus, and it says up to 10 minutes there, but if you are taking 10 minutes to walk to class, you're going very slowly. Uh, so you really are living right on campus. One of the biggest differences between UK accommodation as residents compared to what you may be used to or have seen in North America is you would typically get your own bedroom uh, and most of our accommodation offers a bathroom within that bedroom as well so an ensuite facility a bit like a mini hotel room really you've got your bed your desk your wardrobe with toilet shower and sink facilities within there as well um, big focus for UK education is independence in terms of study but also living um, so we wouldn't typically do meal plans at Ulster you would 
generally make meals for yourself. So you have a kitchen and communal area for you and typically up to around seven other students. So you would cook your own meals within that kitchen, maybe have your breakfast. There's cafes, restaurants, bars, shops, everything all around the campus and in the cities. But generally it's more affordable to cook for yourself. Um, but, you know, staying in that accommodation, brilliant way of making friends and getting to know other people. And you'll be with domestic students from Northern Ireland as well as potentially other international students too. I believe there's another slide there, Yasser, as well, just about the... Um, that's about it. That's about, I think this is the pictures of the accommodation. Yeah, so that's the accommodation in the Belfast campus. So you can see top images, typically the bedroom, top right is the kitchen and lounge area. And top left is what your ensuite facility would look like. Only downside to that is you've got to clean it all yourself. Uh, so something you have to learn to deal with. Um, but there is a cinema in there, there's a gym. You can see another kitchen further down and every Wednesday a chef from a restaurant comes and teaches you how to make different meals. So all about that independence and learning to cook for yourselves. So yeah, that's our accommodation and it is, well, it was built last year, so it's brand new, it's amazing. Excellent. Um, over to you, Scott. Thanks. So yeah, this is just a little breakdown for, for what uh, students can come to expect in terms of, of living expenses uh, when you study. It's probably on average for for the UK as uh, as a whole uh, and, and for Glasgow in, in particular. Uh, like uh, the other institutions that are here tonight, we also have our own on-campus accommodation and uh, that is available from £99 a week uh, can start from from ninety nine pounds a week and is right across the road from from campus and is available for uh, undergraduate and postgraduate students. We also have uh, our accommodation team who can set you up uh, with private housing providers uh, and put you in contact with them. Again, we have a number of kind of private housing uh, options right on kind of the doorstep of our campus. So it just gives you kind of a variety and different options in terms of kind of what experience you have and kind of what budget you have uh, as well to spend. Uh, but as you can see, this is just a breakdown of what you can expect. And, and as, I, as I mentioned, Glasgow is one of uh, the more affordable major cities uh, within the UK uh, and Europe as well. I, I wouldn't even, because of the transport links are so great, so easy to get around the city as well, I, I would expect them not even to be quite as high as that. Uh, these costs, obviously, uh, within within these costs and, and within your uh, ability to study, you can also work uh, and the, the visa, the student visa gives you the ability to, to work uh, a certain amount of hours per week depending on, on your level of study. Uh, so you can offset these costs with, with part-time work and, and look to balance that along with your study where you can. Uh, we've got a centralised career service service uh, plus each one of our schools has a career service uh, as well so they can provide you assistance in terms of uh, looking for part-time work that that may be unrelated to your degree or very related to your degree and help you gain some some work experience uh, or paid work experience uh, alongside your alongside your study uh, to supplement your study and obviously uh, make it more affordable whilst you are studying. Thank you, Scott. Um, Jane, it's your slide now. Thank you. Just another option for our accommodation, really. We have halls of residence as well. Um, they tend to be some on the campus, some maybe a 20 minute journey across London. Um, good way to make it more affordable. Prices are slightly higher, but you're looking about 800 to 1,000 pounds a month, really, um, for most of our accommodation. Um, we encourage students, um, undergraduate students, to stay together so they meet people from different subject areas because we've got those different campuses across the city. So it's a great way to meet. And then we have separate postgraduate accommodation as well. Um, yep. Yeah. Thank you. All right. So this, uh, this slide is basically, I would like to highlight uh, probably um, uh, all of the universities to highlight on uh, the documentations required for the application process, uh, not just for the admission process, but also if there's additional stuff to be done for a scholarship uh, to make a separate application or what things to be looked at in your personal statements or in a scholarship essays. So I will start with Johnny first and uh, we take them from there. 
Brilliant. Yes. I mean, to be honest, you've got everything pretty much listed there. Um, I would mostly say the key things that we make our decision on is your high school uh, diploma, your leaving qualifications on that uh, for undergrad. But you're absolutely right with some of these um, things you've listed here, such as the portfolio and the interview. But the statement of purpose is absolutely one of the most important things that you really need to consider, um, especially for us. It can make a big difference between getting a place on the course and not. So take a look on the UCAS site. There's a, a guidance of how to write a personal statement for the UK. Very different to what you may be used to in North America. It's straight to the point. If you apply through UCAS, 4,000 characters. Um, so short, sweet, straight to the point. So if I ask you, Kirsten, in terms of personal statement, what really, you know, one of the top programs of your school is pharmacy. What students should be looking really to add on those personal statements if they're applying to those for popular programs? I mean, to be honest, one of the most important things is accuracy, making sure what you're writing in your personal statement is accurate to the course you're applying for. However, if you're applying through UCAS, be cautious about adding other inst institution names because if you're applying to UCAS, it could go to five institutions. So the last thing you wanna do is apply to five universities and include one sole university. Could almost rule you out offers for those other institutions. Um, so for something like pharmacy, it would be saying about why you wanna study that, what part of that, um, your high school education has inspired you to go into that further study of uh, pharmacy. What part of chemistry is it that you enjoy, or maybe it's the biological side of those chemicals that help the body, perhaps. Um, but also importantly is the, the career that you want to go into. I mean, pretty self-explanatory doing pharmacy, but um, you know how that, how that degree could set you up for a career within the industry. Uh, you could also reflect on the complexity that it is to get into the industry in Canada. Um, so yeah, it's just about being precise, not talking about what inspired you as a two-year-old kind of thing. It really has to be about the education and your career. Great, great. Uh, Scott, do you want to add something on this one? Yeah, I mean, Johnny uh, has done a really great job of covering, covering most of it there. I, I think... Uh, from our from our side, you know, it, it's just really important to to kind of relate back to, to the topic and, and to the subject that that you want to study and, and make everything that that you that you put in the uh, in the personal statement relatable to to the program that you are studying. Obviously, you know, if you're applying for different programs through UCAS, I can understand that that's maybe not as straightforward. But if there's a a pattern or or a kind of similar subject area within the programs that you are applying for, then then hopefully that should be achievable. And and for us, it's just making sure that you don't just list things for the sake of listing things. You know, listing achievements. Uh, you know, just for the sake of listing achievements pick you know a couple of specific examples and really hone in on them and really show how those relate to the subject that you're studying how they relate to uh, potentially the university and, and why those particular achievements would make you a good candidate or a good student for the institution for that program uh, of study excellent um jane i would like to uh invite you if you have if anything you'd like to add um, before you go ahead, I mean, I would like to uh, ask one though, how important is uh, the reference letter and how many reference letters you're looking at at undergrad level? So for Westminster, we asked for one. Um, how important the reference is. Um, that can depend on the course, to be completely honest, for Westminster. And it also probably depends a lot on your grades. Um, because if you've got um, some students do really well in the subject they want to pursue at university, but maybe haven't done quite so well in some other subject areas, but have a strong reference, then that will really help support the application. If you've got fantastic grades across the board, um, you know, a really good personal statement, then maybe we don't need to look at the reference as well. Especially this year, when a lot of um, classes are changing the grading or people are studying online, the reference can really help add a bit of background um, and, um, about you as a student. Um, so it, it can be important for us. Uh, we look at everything together. 
Um, and I was just going to mention in terms of all of the universities, um, the Student Solutions can help with this, have equivalency guidance for what we look for, for the different territories and provinces from Canada and the grading and marking systems that we ask for. Um, so we will have um, information about that on our um, website and pages um, and can help guide you further in terms of specific grades. Um, and then for us, on all our course pages, um, we have the standard requirements of the high school grades, um, the statement, the reference. Um, and then if we ask for something more like a portfolio or an interview or there's any other kind of test, it will state that on the course application page. So practical courses asking for portfolios, um, some courses asking for interview would always tell you there. Excellent. Um, I noticed a few of them uh, uh, did join a bit late, so I will just like to uh, go to the first slide of uh, my contact details, just in case if you have any questions regarding to applying to these uh, schools in the UK. And if you have any questions, please feel free to contact us uh, in one of the ways. Either you can contact us on the number or the email address, or simply you can link your UCAS application because we are one of the UCAS Register Center in Canada. So the buzzword to use for 2021 application is SSES, which is Student Solution Educational Services 2021. Uh, we'll be able to help and uh, guide you further on, on each of the documents which is required by the universities and uh, uh, what, uh, what programs you will be much more suitable for. Um, by this, we are ending this presentation, but I'm going to go uh, to the chat section and see if we have some questions and uh, we will then go accordingly uh, to ask uh, questions from one by one. Um, are you guys ready? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, I'm just trying to see if you're gonna be unmuting yourselves. Should we all just leave our microphones on, say you haven't seen it? Yeah. Yes. Perfect, perfect. Okay, so let me just go through the questions and see how it goes from there. Okay, there's a question uh, uh, from one of uh, the students mentioning, just checking, is this specifically for students in Canada? I am a US based student looking for details on UK abroad studies. So, uh, would you do you guys cover study abroad uh, uh, studies for North American students? All three of you. Yeah, absolutely. So, I am I'm the region manager for the Americas. So, I support students from Canada right down to Argentina and Chile. But if there happens to be people from other regions of the world, I also add an extra bit of support for South Asia and Africa. So, yeah, happy to help for any region really. I think a lot of the information is the same, but obviously we have country guidance equivalencies for, for the US as well. And then if it's study abroad as in to come for a semester rather than the whole programme, then I think we'll all have information about that as well. Yeah, much much the same. Uh, yeah, the obviously the, the the information that we've discussed is is relevant for for students from, from all over the world. Uh, but yeah, we, we have different entry requirements for, for students from, from the US that are specific to, to the US uh, education system. And, and those can be found on, on our website alongside uh, the specific requirements for Canada. Uh, we do have a, a study abroad and exchange team here uh, at GCU as well. And, and my colleagues are, are more than happy to, to speak with anybody that, that is in, interested in, in those opportunities and the exchange opportunities that, that we can offer here. Excellent. Um, I believe I can answer this question. It says, is there a financing available for UK banks for international students? And I believe no, because they are more related to the UK residents. Right, guys, if I'm, uh, but uh, I mean, if there is anything else you would like to add, is there any funding available from the local banks for international students as well in UK? Not really, I no. I'm not aware of any, um, in, but in terms of banks and bank loans, um, that was the question, wasn't it? Because obviously there's a student loans, government student loans that are for the UK students. Um, but I think we will accept Canadian loan um, financing. Right. So it depends upon the provincial loans, of course, where they're applying from, whether they are from British Columbia or Alberta or Saskatoon or Saskatchewan. Uh, they basically, the university has to be in the registered panel or the approved schools of the 
uh, of the relevant province where they are applying for, so that they once they go for uh, the OSA funding uh, from Ontario or British um, Columbia student loan, for example, the individual university has to be part of the approved providers. So that's how basically works for Canadians who are applying for local uh, local provincial loans. But for sure, that uh, as I said, like for international students, if you're looking for financing in the UK, then for sure, then uh, it's a it's a no, of course. And I think it's applicable for every international students wherever they are basically applying to. Either they are coming to Canada or Australia or UK. It's exactly the same. Um, there's a question from Stephen saying, what are the criteria for being awarded a scholarship? Uh, for us, it's a guaranteed £2,000 scholarship for all international students. So basically, as long as you're not from the UK or Europe, you've already qualified for that. <laughs> well, Westminster, as I said, it's a different scheme. So it depends on the amount you're applying for. Uh, smaller scholarships, just look at grades plans. Uh, the bigger you apply for, if you're applying for a big scholarship, you have to demonstrate financial need, you're co in competition with the whole world, and you have to show a development plan, what you will do with your studies. Um, we want to see that students have a clear, um, logical career plan for how it will help them in the future. Uh, yeah, so, so we can have a mixture of what we have automatic scholarships, which, which I touched on uh, during the presentation, both at undergraduate and postgraduate level, that as, if you are an international student coming to study at GCU for the first time, then, then you'll automatically be offered, offered those scholarships. If we also have uh, additional scholarships that you can apply for that are potentially subject-based or level-based, uh, we've got... Uh, a student, a student ambassadorship, uh, which is a full tuition scholarship at, at postgraduate level, which has a separate application and, and would require you to show how you are, uh, how you reflect the, the university's motto. We have fashion scholarships that you might need to submit uh, a personal video and say how you, why you should qualify for that scholarship. So, depending on the on the subject area and and the requirements of that specific scholarship, uh, and what subject it's relating to, what school it's relating to, uh, the a separate application process for those would, would maybe differ depending on what, what the scholarship is. But in terms of the automatic ones, those those come through automatically when you do apply. Okay. Okay, this one is more specific for, for Johnny. Uh, for a personal statement, let's say a student who's looking to go into a pharmacy program and they were president of Environment Club because it does not directly relate should they not talk about their experience? I, I wouldn't rule it out. I think it shows initiative to be involved. Being a president takes a lot of organization skills and planning, and that is something that we look for in all students because all degrees take a lot of prep, take a lot of writing, take a lot of ability to adapt and support others. So yeah, I'd certainly say include it. Uh, it's certainly worth mentioning. I think what Scott mentioned was really important don't just list absolutely everything for the sake of it, um, but be specific. So something like that certainly uh, could help strengthen a po uh, personal statement or statement of purpose. I think there, uh, I would like to add my point here. That is where we come into play as uh, uh, the professionals to guide you on personal statement. The reason being because UCAS limit you up to 47 lines, which is about 40,000 40, 40, words in total, right? And you have to be very specific, like what to be included and what the universities will be looking at. So probably anything what you're writing and it, it helps a lot for international, for students as well, that if they write something, as long as they can, they can just have a, uh, you know, ask us to look into it, like what areas to be given more importance, for example. And then of course, narrow it down according to what the requirement is for UCAS personal statement. So that really helps you as well are uh, the students as well to really highlight because if we do not know like what to be included or what is basically you know us I have come across with the students who have uh, who have who have quite a bit of uh, experience in something which is not related to the program but they were such an exceptional uh, you know in terms of community work for example and that was very inspiring because the universities always like to see like you know students who basically can bring something um, to the school as well uh, in terms of, you know, either it would be community experience or, you know, any kind of experience that can help fill while they are basically in the class, for example. 
So I think if you have any questions about, you know, what to be included and what would be the best idea, probably it's always a good shot to, you know, uh, talk, uh, probably send us some of the personal statement from your students and we will be able to guide if that would be very helpful. And then of course we look from there. Two main pieces of advice I would offer in terms of writing a personal statement. One would be if you and a friend are looking at applying to the UK, don't write them together. <laughs> and especially if you're applying to the same institution, they need to be unique to you. Uh, it could be much easier to write together coming up with ideas, but it really needs to be specific to yourself. The other one would be, <laughs> don't be modest. You, this is about selling yourself for these courses. You need to be talking about how good you are and how good, you know, why you did this and how amazing it was. And sometimes students downplay that. So pass it on to your mom and dad to read, pass it on to your brother, your sister, maybe some friends, because they might suggest something that you hadn't even thought to include, but it turns out it was a fantastic idea. Something that was amazing that you've done throughout your life so far. So yeah, really consider the opinions of what other people think about you, because uh, some people can be slightly modest about it. Excellent. Um, Jane, can you highlight on um, this one, like for those in IB and Ontario secondary program, which grades should be submitted towards the application? Either the- So if you're doing both, you mean? Is that the yes. Um, so really you can include both, um, but there's no reason to not to include what you're, what you're studying. And we do understand that people are following more than one syllabus, but that means we may mean the grades. Um, uh, and not necessarily as high in both areas. Um, so for normally for high school, we look for between, look for about 70% for um, Ontario, but we've got guidance and listings on, on the Canada page for all um, of the different systems. Um, and IB grades are also on our course pages. Um, so, but if you're taking a com combination of both, then make sure you include that and we will look at that and, and look at both together. Excellent. So I'm just going through the questions which, uh, which I just have to ask. Um, um, okay, uh, I'm currently living in Canada, though originally born in England and have a British citizenship. If, if I'm applying from Canada, would that still make me international student? Um, I would say like a start with Johnny because I think Scotland might have a little bit different to say. I don't know. <laughs> hey. so, so, so go ahead. <laughs> I'm always I, I'm always reluctant to say <laughs> uh, kind of place my place my heart on one kind of certain fee status when when somebody asks a fee status question because there's a number of factors that are it's our admissions team that that reviews this and uh, and whilst they will when somebody normally applies they they put somebody in a certain category. If somebody doesn't feel like they should be in that category, they will give somebody the, opp the opportunity to appeal it, provide evidence and, and supporting statements to say why why they should be in a different category. So I, I'm going to more or less sit on the fence and say <laughs> potentially, but it would be up for our uh, it would be up to our admissions team to decide and take in a number of factors when they are uh, deciding on on somebody's uh, fee status. For us, typically, you need to have been living in the UK or the EU for at least three years prior to the course start date. Take a, little, take a look at Student Finance England and look at their guidance on that um, because it'll be similar. But Scott's absolutely right. Uh, it can really vary uh, different circumstances. For us, typically, you'd be on international fees, but you don't need a visa if you've got your British passport. For us as well, Irish passports as well. Uh, I suppose for all EU as well. Um, but there can be certain exceptions depending on your family circumstances. Um, so really submit your application for us, especially as an international student, and then you can always be tuition fee assessed. You can always ask to complete a fee assessment form because it is very complicated, but it's exactly, it's normally three years where you've been living and working or, and paying taxes or studying for the past three years. Um, and the UKISA website's really good for things like that. UKCISA.org has a lot of guidance and information about how things like that are assessed in the UK. Excellent. Um, I think one question is again related to the scholarships, which uh, you guys already have answered. So uh, to make a scholarship uh, application, either you will get a guaranteed scholarship uh, from Ulster, which is £2,000 per year if you've been accepted. 
uh, or you can also make a separate application depending upon the program you're going into Glasgow Caledonian or Westminster. So depending upon individual universities where you're applying to, but yeah, it's, it's a very, uh, it's, it's kind of like a, a guaranteed scholarship thing. Like if you make an application and get an offer or make a slide or make an a uh, separate application if you wanted to apply for higher ones. Um, just a quick question regarding to uh, the current pandemic, guys. Uh, what do you think, like currently for January session, are you looking that the, it's going to be on campus studies? Ours is a hybrid mix, so some students are on campus for limited access. So for practical courses, we prioritise students to have access from February. Obviously, it all depends on the situation. We're all following government guidance, um, but we are open. So many students are studying from home, studying online, um, but we are we are here if people want to travel and are able and it's safe for them to travel, then they can come and join us in London. And it depends by course whether or not they have much teaching on site. Yes, uh, Scott. Yeah, it, it, exactly the same. So, so we are taking a kind of blended learning approach with a mixture of face-to-face of -face and uh, an online learning. Again, uh, very much depending on the on the practical nature of of the program will will be dependent on the, on the ratio of face-to-face uh, -to, -face to to online. Uh, we are trying to give all of our students an a, an element of face-to-face -face where where possible and where practical, uh, but still with keeping the majority of it online uh, at the moment. Uh, like Jane said, at, it's, it's really important to kind of stress and emphasize that at the moment because, you know, uh, if it carries on the way it is, then, then we are going to carry on with that, uh, with this approach for, for trimester B in, in January. But, uh, you know, it depends whether it gets worse or, or, or if, it, if, it gets, if it gets better, you know, hopefully it's going to get better and, and we can start to relax and start to implement uh, more uh, face face to face but again we're uh, we're at the hands of of the government of for each of our respective regions and uh, and and we need to kind of just follow the guidelines that, that are implemented by them absolutely same for us blended learning uh i'm gonna put it by myself folks uh, so the same as westminster Glasgow. right so if in case the uh there is no branded hybrid learning i would say or blended learning i would say so would the master's program still be online, Johnny, for January? Uh, so some are and some are blended. Uh, so the hybrid version. We are, the intentions are that as the semester goes on, we aim to have more and more face-to-face -face teaching. As Jane mentioned, there are courses where it's, it's crucial to the learning outcomes that there has to be face-to-face, -face, you know, in-person teaching. But well, that's done at a reduced capacity uh, to take into student staff safety. Um, so, yeah, some courses are online, some courses such as our MBAs, some of those high volume lecture theatre style classes are being taught online. You know, when you've got like a 300 size lecture theatre, yeah. we can't be housing that many students in those classes. So they have been significantly reduced by teaching online. The plan is, instead of that being one big class, it'll be broken down into multiple classes when we are bringing more face-to-face. -face. Uh, but as uh, Scott and Jane said, we just have to monitor as things go. Um, you know, we're trying to plan for a year, but things are changing almost weekly. Every now and then. Sure. You know? So uh, we, yeah, intent, full intention is to be back, you know, resume normal teaching, normal student life. But do note that international students, are still eligible to enroll on campus as long as guidelines say that you can travel from your country to the UK um, and you can still be online with the new policy during this COVID period. So you can still gain an experience, you can still go and travel around within reason, you just got to understand there is measures in place to protect everybody. Excellent. So I don't see any more questions right now, uh, but I would like to uh, just ask you one last thing about what's your last tip for people who are applying for uh, for undergrad program in September next year? Apply soon. <laughs> I was literally about to say the same thing. If you're applying through UCAS, the deadline is January the 15th. If you're applying for medicine, it's too late. Um, it's typically mid-October that um, so yeah, <laughs> exactly what Jane said, apply soon, uh, get your applications in. Right. Yeah. So I'll, I'll, okay. 
<laughs> I'll echo that. Yeah, just just do your research. Obviously, uh, and invest time into into your options and, and really consider the uh, the benefits of of certain programs and certain institutions and, and look at what you know institutions offer offer the best opportunities in in each different in each different programs and, and just just do your research and make sure that you you know you're fully prepared and you're fully knowledgeable before you submit an application uh, for for an undergraduate program especially uh, especially internationally so and, and yeah apply apply as soon as you can just do it's great sorry so it's great at the moment because there are lots of virtual open event open events um, tutors doing um, taster sessions online so it's a really good time uh, to find out more and to get that access that you may not have had um, in previous years so that's a bonus um, of us all being online um, and a lot of universities do consider students after the UCAS deadline I know Westminster does across many of our programs depends on, on the course um, but the sooner you can submit the better excellent Those yeah days. I think sorry Joy go ahead I was just saying those dates that I mentioned there, there for September 21 entry. Um, you know, if you're 16, 17, obviously there's still plenty of time for yourselves to apply. Uh, yeah, well, I was going to say, obviously that's the that would be the benefit for for applying with uh, with our partner, Student, student Solution, because you know, obviously they are not bound by those restrictions, and we can accept direct applications from undergraduate students applying through through Student Solutions. So. Uh, Certainly, if, if the UCAS deadlines don't fit fit for you or work for you, uh, then certainly we can we can accept applications for for certain programs direct uh, from if you are applying through Student Solutions uh, after those deadlines as well. Perfect. Uh, thank you very much, guys. It's been almost uh, an hour now. I don't want to keep uh, engaging everybody together. <laughs> I know it's pretty late out there as well. Uh, but thank you very much. Uh, it's been a great uh, learning from you guys uh, from different part of UK. I mean, you can't uh, have, you know, so much of information in one hour from Scotland, Northern Ireland and from London, right? Right there. But thanks a lot for your, uh, for your time and commitment. Um, if, uh, if, and thank you very much uh, um, uh, people who have been attending this. Uh, if you have any questions, any concerns, please do feel free to contact to the email address I just uh, tagged down. Uh, you're more than welcome to uh, share your questions with us. And of course, I will be uh, able to uh, get the right answers from the individual universities. Uh, feel free to contact me, but thank you very much once again and keep yourself safe. It's been a really challenging time for all of us. Uh, we are trying to do our best but, best, but you know, this is like the second wave coming up. We all just need to take necessary precautions and follow the government guidelines. That's what we can do the best. But thanks again, Jane. Thanks, Scott. And thanks, uh, Johnny, for your time. And uh, it's been a pleasure. Cheers, Yasser. Thanks, everyone. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you very much.